歡迎大家嚟到首座確行青年公藝教育計劃嘅研討會。咁咧，我就自我介紹先，我就係首座確行嘅項目經理，亦都係今日嘅主持 Winnie。咁誒，好多謝咧誒首座確行嘅一眾老師啦、學生啦、嘉賓啦，同埋公眾咧嚟到參加我哋今日嘅研討會。今日我哋嘅研討會嘅題目咧係公藝教育的多元面向，手作技藝、文化傳識同埋社會實踐嘅。咁相信咧，大家手上面咧都有份長刊㗎啦。咁啊，大家依家可以慢慢睇。咁誒，其實我哋今日個研討會咧係分咗上晝同埋下晝兩節嘅，每一節咧就三小時，中間咧有一個鐘頭嘅午飯時間。上下午環節咧嗰個 run down 咧都係一樣嘅。咁朝頭早咧，我哋會有誒、呃、幾位 speaker 咧同我哋分享下工藝教育嘅唔同面向啦。然後咧就有一個嘉賓嘅討論環節。咁去到最尾咧就有一個誒、呃、觀眾嘅問答環。環節嘅，咁一間就歡迎咧各位參加者咧舉手發問嘅。咁啊，事不宜遲啦，我哋依家咧就有請香港中文大學藝術系系主任、賽馬會首座確行青年工藝教育計劃項目聯合總監 Professor Frank Frinohom 同我哋致開幕詞，有請 Frank。Thank you, Willie.、Uh, so, brief、uh, introduction of Uh, the project. I don't think I should do this because we'll spend the whole day talking about it.、Uh, very happy to see such a big turnout to this wonderful event that kind of wraps up the three years of the project because there's more coming with the trip to Taiwan and so on, to which I was not invited. But <laughs> <laughs> joking.、Um, so three years of handmade well-being. Uh, Key has been in the department for over seven years. All right, so we, we you know we've we've lived with this for a, a, a while, and then for reasons that are、uh, too boring to explain, we it, it's also a very important activity of the department as such. So this will play also a very good, very important role in promoting the department for. A number of evaluations made by the Hong Kong government that are also terribly important. So、uh, it was—I can't describe how important <laughs> and made well-being has been for us all.、Um, I've already given a short speech at、um, a PMQ、uh, for the. I forgot what it what it was called. Well, the, the students, a lot of the students of the projects were selling、uh, their wares.、Uh, yes, and I was、uh, talking about the whole project as something that is that was a continuation of a lifelong practice、uh, by Key. Okay, so、uh, when I say that, I also should emphasize that it's not just Key as an artist doing his stuff. It's much more than that, of course, because it involved. A lot of people, a lot of institutions, a lot of schools, a lot of teachers. I recognize a, one that I've known for a while here.、Uh, so it's to me, it's exactly what art is, has been for a while, of course, but is destined to be more and more.、Uh, not just the stuff we see at Art Basel. And to be perfectly honest, every time I go to Art Basel, I feel a little sick now. Selling art is still a very important part of art. You know, sure, it should be like this. But、uh, the fact is that it benefits only a few artists and a few rich collectors. That's it. Okay, art should be much more than that. It should be community-based. All right, and this has been also kind of my focus for a long time. And that's exactly what handmade well-being has been, and will hopefully continue to be in in whatever forms that this will take. Okay. So、uh, I think I will stop here. But I'll, sorry, I'm not going right away because I have to give my presentation now. And I chose to talk about well the very important issue of craft, all right, what it is, and I will take、uh, both a historical and a comparative、uh, approach to talk about、uh, craft. So. 好，咁依家咧，誒，我哋有請阿 Frank 咧，同我哋分享第一個演講嘅題目啦。對立分差，以比較形式看歐美和中國的藝術與工藝。咁啊，交個時間俾阿 Frank 啦
is working. All right, I'd rather move around when I present. Okay, so I'm mainly an art historian, I guess. Uh, I've been teaching uh, art history in both uh, the so-called West and China for a long time. Um, I did a lot of um, comparative studies, so I've always been interested in looking at how concepts exist in these different uh, cultures. So, uh, you know, usually we say that uh, opposites sort of come back together. It was seldom the case with the issues uh, related to art and craft, and it is these two terms that I will look into. So I'll, I'll start with, with China um, and talk about what, you know, uh, the, the usual prism through which we look at the history of art in China, especially when it comes to the visual arts, is to look at the history of literati painting, okay, Wen Zhenhua, mm -hmm. um, as if it was the only form of, of art <laughs> that existed in China. But it sort of makes sense because we tend to look at art as an intellectual pursuit, more than something that involves uh, the hand, you know, and the hand is basically always the things we go back to when we talk about craft. Hence the title of the whole project, Handmade Wellbeing, okay. Um, when the literati tradition really starts in China, which, you know, arguably would be the, the Yuan dynasty, but really the Song dynasty, because that's when uh, artists really start to, to conceptualize their their approach to art making. And the first uh, theorists of art, those who wrote about art, and there were a lot of them in the, in the history of China, uh, very quickly defined their practice as serious artists as completely the opposite of what the craftsmen were doing, okay? And this concept of, of Jiang, is always used as the foil, the opposite of the literati tradition. Literati artists considered that the craftsmen of art were horrible people. <laughs> okay. And uh, when I, s I, I did a long research on uh, art theory in the 18th century in both Europe and China, and I realized that there were very similar attitudes taken by the artist of the academy in Europe from the 17th and 18th century onwards, and the literati artist. Both of them were considering that there was, you know, what they were doing was elegant, was good, whereas the craftsmen were vulgar. Okay, and you have really interesting concept. This concept of vulgarity also exists in the theory of Chinese art. And you have to wonder what happened. Well, okay, my, one of my favorite paintings, because it's so weird. And, you know, I think it's like the, the Mona Lisa in, in Europe. Nobody questions the Mona Lisa. All right? We accept as a given that it is the greatest painting ever made. And I think something a little similar happened to this very famous piece by uh, Zhao Mengfu, right? So done during the Yuan Dynasty. It's so famous that we don't even look, we don't even see it anymore, okay? We only see this through a lot of layers of historical interpretation, of fame, of institutional interpretation, and so on. But let's face it, it it's, a, it's kind of a terrible painting, right? When you compare it to the very, very, almost realistic uh, paintings that were done a little before, uh, it feels very weird. And then you write, you, sorry, you read what was said about this, and you realize that the weirdness was part of the project. Okay? If you are uh, a technically proficient artist, no, sorry, it's very difficult to avoid the traps of using words like art, craft, and so on. If you are a very proficient image maker, 
you see a landscape, you, you can do almost, you know, you can render what you see almost directly as if it was what you see on the piece of paper. Well, in the literary tradition, when you do this, you're a craftsman. You're not doing it right. So the first literati painters made of clumsiness, and that's another very interesting concept, draw, okay? Their purpose, their goal, they want their paintings to look clumsy so that they will not be mistaken for the horrible craft of uh, these craftsmen who are not uh, doing proper art. And you have to really wonder what happened. So this, this came up with a whole series of additional uh, concepts. Like, you know, these things. If, uh, if a craftsman is doing a painting with a lot of details, attentions to rendering what you see as you know, exactly what you see, like, like a photo photography, for instance, it's usually considered overcooked, all right? Whereas what you're looking for in something like this is raw, okay? Uh, same thing, dexterous chow, not good. If you're a literati painter, you don't want that. You want to be spontaneous. But then, you know, what does that mean? <laughs> it's not very clear at all what it means. And that's kind of the whole point. All right, so we'll, we'll go back there. Um, okay, I'll, I'll just give you the answer quickly. <laughs> because it's exactly what happened also in Europe in the 17th century with the creation of the first academies. The academies in Europe, the first one was in France, created by the King Louis XIV, and he wanted to give away, to take away, the power to decide what art should be from the guilds. And the guilds are associations of craftsmen. All right, so we'll see that uh, the difference between an artist and a craftsman really begins during the Renaissance in Italy. Okay? But by the 17th century, there's an institutional effort. You create institutions to separate the craftsmen from the artist. And something became necessary because for, it's the same in China, you know, the, the, the problem with that kind of painting is that it is not based on skills. Basically, you know, these scholars, they were doing calligraphy like eight hours a day. So they can handle the brush, right? They have no problem. It's like, this, it comes naturally to them. So uh, if you're a calligrapher, anyone can do this. I, I mean that, all right? And to be perfectly honest, when you look at the literally millions of paintings made by literati in China over the centuries, a uh, very little of it is actually <laughs> pleasing to the eye, all right? But then you realize that's, that's not what they're looking for. So that's where the, the, the social issue starts to, to, to come up. Um, one of my favorite uh, writers, the French uh, sociologist Pierre Bourdieu, he came up with the idea of, of social capital. That when you are in a position, you defend your social capital as if it was money, okay? And in the case of the literati painters, they wanted to protect themselves because their skills were not that great against the very skillful craftsmen. Okay. And the way they did this was by defining, well, actually not defining, but coming up with this concept of vulgarity. Okay. And it always works the same way. And unfortunately, a lot, a lot of the artwork still functions like this. What I'm doing is great. What you're doing is bad. You're vulgar. I'm elegant. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, you know. That's another concept that really comes out in the context of literary art. And you realize that it's, it has nothing to do with style or skills or anything, but everything to do with a certain social groups wanting to define itself as better than the other social group. And something exactly similar happened in Europe at the time of the creations of the academies, as I will show you later. 
So, don't get me wrong, all right? I, I find that amazing precisely because it's so daring. You know, you look at other paintings of Zhao Mengfu. The guy could do anything. He made horses, paintings, portraits, and everything like that. He was very skillful. But for him, well, unfortunately, skills can be acquired and basically by anyone. You know, that's kind of the essence of art education. You <laughs> but he decided to go the other way and do something that did not rely on the mastery of skills. Okay? And that's very, very tricky because if you start doing this, you realize that you're giving to anyone the possibility to make art. You know, if you think that uh, clumsiness is a good thing, well, <laughs> I never learned to do Chinese painting. If that's true, I can do a Chinese painting, okay? And just because I'm a professor at Chinese, Chinese university, I can say that, you know, I'm elegant and you're vulgar and so on. So it's a very, very tricky thing to do. And yet it functions very, very powerfully. And this will have really powerful consequences on this idea that art and craft are opposites, okay? We need to really think about this and look at this in both a historical and a comparatist a con con context, sorry. All right, so, of course, in Europe, the whole division, separation between art and craft is really an, an, an effect of uh, the Renaissance. And very much like in China, what happened is that something became more intellectual. Before the Renaissance, basically in the social structure of Europe, uh, a workshop making furniture and a workshop making images, there's no social difference. They are considered to be equally important, okay? With the Renaissance, something happened, which is, you know, we, we, we know the history very well. It sort of starts with the fall of Constantinople. A lot of in philosophy and so on started to come to, to Western Europe through Italy. Uh, there was more interest in, 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 in intellectual pursuits. And uh, very quickly, a number of, of people, again, I was going to say the word artist, but it's confusing, number of people, especially architects in Italy, uh, started to transform their practice away from just a skill-based activity towards an intellectual pursuit. And that's the big change, all right? Uh, very slowly, in fact, the idea that art was an intellectual pursuit more than just something done by the hands, done through skills, sort of defines the whole, the whole period. Uh, you know, the, the, one of my uh, favorite thing to, to use to define the Renaissance was Leonardo. Don't call him Da Vinci, please. It's not his name, okay? Leonardo is the name. And he defined painting as uh, una cosa mentale, a thing of the mind, all right? And this, to me, defines exactly the whole process of the Renaissance as for image makers, moving away from the idea that making images is a skill, something that you learn in a workshop as a job, towards something that you need to do by reading. All right, reading becomes extremely important to these artists of the Renaissance. And then we, start, we can start using the word art. But for a long time, there was a lot of um, hesitancy. You know, people were not too sure of what they were doing. And for someone like him, so this is the Duke of Urbino. So Urbino is a really small town in Italy that has one of the most famous uh, palace of the early Renaissance, which is a very strange mixture of a medieval fortress and a very elegant palace. And the Duke of Urbino was one of those patrons of the Renaissance. So some of the most uh, famous artists of the period 
like uh, Piero della Francesca come from Urbino, and they were the first to really conceive of uh, architecture and urbanism as something to create a better society, a better world, and so on. So you see, these ambitions were quite amazing, quite, quite early on. And at the same time as you have this uh, artist, Piero della Francesca, who also wrote a treatise, a book explaining the rules of um, perspective. So really an intellectual, okay? But in the same palace of Urbino, where the Duke uh, lived, you have this very famous uh, studiolo, means a small room. Uh, and everything you see here is flat. It's old marquetry. You know, it's different pieces of colored wood that look like it's three-dimensional, okay? And we don't know who made that. There's no name, okay? So you realize that by the time the Duke of Urbino and the early Renaissance kicks in, well, there's very little difference between the art of uh, Piero della Francesca and the craft of the guy who did this. But believe you me, at the time the Duke commissioned all this, he was not thinking in terms of this is art, this is craft, okay? These are notions that come much later, in fact. So, uh, hold on. Uh, sorry. So I was just also giving you things like this. So, Lorenzo Ghiberti is one of the, the architects and, and sculptors who played a very important role in the early Renaissance in Florence. And uh, when you read uh, books of art history, and remember that art history is also an invention of the 19th century, okay? Uh, there's a, a famous saying, well, uh, sorry, I, I flew back f from Europe uh, a few days ago. I'm still badly jet lagged, so my mind is not functioning very well, so I can't remember his name. Uh, the French guy who wrote the book on socially engaged art is, him, anyway, okay, so. And he said that, very interesting, he said that art, if, so thank you, Jacques, uh, no, not Rancière, no, no, the, the, not the philosopher, the, the, the art critic, never mind, all right? But anyway, he said that art is an invention of art historians, okay? That's intriguing, <laughs> okay? In the 19th century, it was the art historians who are themselves the product of this institution called the university, who themselves defined what they were, what they wanted to look at, okay? So they said, this is art and this is not art, <laughs> all right? So keep that in mind. It's not like art historians came up and they studied art, no, 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 no. The art historians came up and defined what they meant by art. And they did this relying on a tradition that begins with the academies, in fact. So, Ghiberti, in the art history of the 19th century, is an artist, okay? Now, how about him? So the name is Luca della Robbia, and you see he's a, basically a contemporary of, Liber of Ghiberti. But he, the problem with <laughs> Luca della Robbia for this 19th century art historian is that he was not using the noble material like bronze and marble. He was doing ceramics. And as such, he was not considered an artist. Okay. Uh, it was a completely gratuitous decision. There was no reason to consider that ceramics was not art, whereas bronze and marble sculptures were, okay? So Luca della Robbia, at the time he was making these ceramics, received the same kind of recognition and income as someone like Ghiberti, okay? So what happened? Why did we decide that Ghiberti was an artist and Luca della Robbia stayed a craftsman? Well, because of decisions made by these strange people called art historians in uh, the 19th century, okay? You look at, the, of course, there's a history to that, okay? But we, we won't go into these details. Suffice it to say that very often the decisions of 
what is art and what is craft, are defined more by social structures and completely personal choices and preferences than by anything that would be, you know, I don't know, objective. So that's kind of my, my, my favorite comparison to do. Uh, you want to see, uh, well, of course, it's a sculpture, so the, the, he won't be there. But if you want to see, uh, I don't know, Raphael, Michelangelo, and so on, you're in London. If you go to London, you go to the National Gallery, okay? National Gallery, art. Yeah, easy. You want to see Luca della Robbia, and very few of his objects are outside of Italy because they're usually part of the, of the, the building. Okay, it's more architecture than anything. But there are still some portable works by Luca della Robbia, and no chance in hell you will see those in the National Gallery, because it's not art. You have to go to the very specific museum of craft called the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Okay. So these decisions also have very, very powerful implications on what gets collected or not, okay? And when you start looking at the history of Chinese art, for instance, it gets really strange very quickly and makes no sense because in China, in Chinese art history, ceramics is part of the history of art, whereas ceramics is part of the history of craft in Europe, okay? So again, you know, don't think there's anything logical in these choices. Again, they have a lot to do with historical context, and social context, in fact. Um, uh, I only have eight minutes left, so okay, so I, I'll just skip this. Just a quick representation of uh, the first academies. So th as I said, the first one is in Paris in the 17th century. Uh, a very famous one would be, of course, uh, the one in London that came much later in the 18th century because the, the English you know, they, th they thought that the academy was a French idea, so they hated it so much that they, they, they decided to have an academy much later. So this is the first uh, group of uh, academic painters. And again, they were the first to start writing about art. Okay? The, the creation of art theory is part of the same context. Craft does not need theory. Art needs theory, all right? It's part of the same mindset. Just also want to indicate that there's a Chinese man in this group. He was just visiting, he was doing these little statues of uh, people. Um, uh, there's also noticeably, because there's a naked guy, there's a model, uh, there are no women in this group, even though there were two members who were females, so the only way they did this was to have their portraits on the wall. Because they couldn't be in the same room as a naked guy, okay? So, uh, you see that Many issues related to the creation of the academies come into play there, uh, including the place of women in the domain of art. Okay? I always say, why are there so few women in museums in Europe? Well, because, of course, they didn't have access to the art education of the academies, with a few exceptions, but also because our definition of art is so narrow. Art is, uh, in Europe, uh, painting, sculpture, architecture, and that's it. You know, if you start to include fashion, for instance, or dressmaking, yeah, you would have to introduce a lot more women in the history of art. But no, fashion is craft to this day, okay? So don't be fooled by these differences between art and craft, okay? They are not essential. They change all the time even though they haven't changed for a long time. So, um, just a quick, uh, bloody hell, very sorry, I, was, I might run over a little bit, okay. Uh, there was, at the time of the, the, the Industrial Revolution also, a sort of a counter-reaction to this idea of craft. Because, for instance, you need to understand that the Victoria and Albert Museum, this 19th century institution, was part of an effort of the, the English Empire to promote and encourage industry. And they created art schools in England so as to support the industry. So the practice of craft, if we have to use this term, 
was far more developed in England than it was in France, for instance. So you also have these regional discrepancies in the definition of art and craft. And someone like this guy, so this is uh, John Ruskin, very, very important art critic, who sort of defended this whole movement called the arts and craft, the pre-Raphaelites, and so on. Uh, he was wondering why, and you know, again, this is very, very personal, but he thought that uh, the world was becoming more ugly. And of course, this was the Industrial Revolution, so you know, there was a lot more factories, uh, pollution, and people were mistreated, and so on. But he was also looking at the, the products of industry. And he thought that things were ugly because everything was the same. You know, when uh, a ceramic factory was producing cups, he, they produced thousands of cups and they're all the same. And he said that's the source of ugliness. And he went to, to Venice and realized that the source of beauty for him was precisely what is made by the hand, not by machines. And he realized that accidents that naturally come when things are made by hand are the origin of beauty. Okay, so he was basically going against a lot of preconceived ideas about beauty. But that also shows you that for someone like John Ruskin, craft, handmade products were far more beautiful and would always be more beautiful than the products of industry. And this was reflected in the arts and craft movement launched by an artist he had uh, supported for many years, uh, William Morris. So William Morris wanted to go away from the conditions of industry, back towards something closer to the workshops of the Middle Ages. And so he, he thought that this was no way to live for human beings, so he wanted to make them live better. So the craft making was a better way to live. <coughs> William Morris also <coughs> produced very beautiful books, produced a uh, kind of cheap furniture for everyone. He also thought that craft should be something that everyone could benefit from, especially in their living environment. So it's not a, a stable history, right? There are people who wanted to go back to more craft and so on. Uh, this, of course, turns a very takes a very different turn at the beginning of the 20th century when artists uh, really decide to go down the way of intellectualization. Art has to be intellectual to survive. And basically, someone like uh, Marcel Duchamp is one of the first to really do this. You know, because um, before and at the same time as Duchamp, uh, painting was going down the way of abstract art. And abstract art is also one way to intellectualize, to move away from the hand and so on. But it was still painting. <laughs> it was still something done by people who need to learn how to paint and so on. With the ready-made, art becomes purely intellectual. You don't even need skills to do art. Okay? So that decision that Duchamp made in 1914 took a long time to really materialize, especially in the context of art education. And to, to me, it becomes full-fledged an intellectual pursuit, mostly after the 1960s, in the 1970s. Someone like Joseph Beuys who will tell you that anyone can be an artist, which is another way to say you don't need skills to make art. This has defined art education, at least in the West, ever since. Okay. Um, it even came up with one, you know, the first time you hear the word, you're sort of horrified because, especially parents, you know, parents who see their, their children go to art school and they graduate and they can't even make a portrait, you know, they can't draw. They can't do calligraphy, they can't paint really. <laughs> right? so, and the parents who still have this rather, you know, kind of conservative notions of what art should be, they don't understand. But the fact is that we don't learn skills anymore in art education, with a few exceptions. This man, for instance, insists on teaching skills, right? Um, a lot of Chinese painters and calligraphers, mm, this is, well, 
arguably this, these are skills, okay, because it's more like, you know, calligraphy, for instance, it's a very strange skill because you, you, you only acquire it through time. You don't learn rules or anything like that. You practice, okay? I always say you can only become a, a good uh, calligrapher when you turn 85 and you've practiced for the last 70 years, all right? Before that, you're just, you're just writing, okay? So, de-skilling became even a key word in the context of art education in both Western Europe and America uh, after the 1970s, okay? And, you know, uh, I, I've seen that name so many times over the years. I still can't pronounce it. I don't know how to read this word. Bulo, Bulo, <laughs> not sure. Anyway, he's very famous, okay? Get, get, uh, so he was he's still considered one of the most important art historians, art critics of the period. And he was talking about this idea of de-skilling, that art is not something relying on the acquisition of skills, all right? which is the, the end part of this process of making art an intellectual pursuit. Okay? This is basically 300 years after 500 years after, Michael, after, after Leonardo talking about painting as a thing of the mind. So, well, art education is now entering probably a different phase, and I think the whole project Key has created takes root within this realization that de-skilling is, uh, is not a bad thing in, in in itself, okay? I still believe that art is an intellectual pursuit before being anything else. And yet, uh, it may have turned out an exaggeration. And th these are some fairly recent articles. Uh, this is in 2017, this is about the same time. And uh, these art critics are saying that, <laughs> well, uh, you know, the problem with de-skilling is the same problem as with you know, clumsiness in literati painting. If you accept that clumsiness is a quality, any idiot can do a literati painting. And that's the problem, okay? If you think that de-skilling is a good idea, any imbecile can do art. And I'm sorry to say, it happened a lot, okay? And even the art market is very happy to <laughs> work with this. So there is uh, a reaction to this, okay? And I was also uh, thinking recently about AI, you know? Uh, I can tell you, in the universities around the world, people are freaking out, all right? Because we're all convinced that students will all cheat and they will all use AI to get really good results and we're all going to be fooled. I sat through some interesting meetings at uh, the Arts Faculty uh, Executive Committee of uh, colleagues, uh, you know, sweating profusely. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Well, um, my personal position, if AI can help students write better papers, yeah! You know, I won't have to suffer reading crap so much. Hopefully, the machines will help. Uh, same thing for art. You know, let's face it, a lot of people have been doing uh, images that are, I think, unnecessary would be a polite way to put it. Well, if the machines can do them, why not, okay? Maybe this will give a little more time for a more interesting artists to come up with more interesting ideas, okay? So these images were all produced <laughs> through AI by Key, <laughs> who puts them on his Facebook page profusely. Recently, there's something, so I didn't follow very well, but there's a lot of tigers in your latest. Uh, yes, okay, tiger, <laughs> right. And uh, again, um, yes, there's a lot to worry about with AI, mostly, but you know, every time a new machine comes along, around that will, take away jobs and so on. People worry, it's perfectly understandable. Uh, when it comes to art, I think it's pretty good news. <laughs> Again, because it will help. And also because I don't think it will matter so much. Because you know, for someone like me especially, and I'm very happy that uh, Seiko Mori will talk about this, you know, art is also about community. 
Art is also about building community. I'm sure you will have questions about that too. Uh, so I don't think it matters too much that AI will produce a lot of images because after all, art is more a process of making. Whether you want to in include craft or not is completely your own opinion, okay? But I always think that the process of making art is more important than the final product. That's my position. A lot of people disagree with that. It's fine, okay? And that's why I'm not worried about AI, because AI doesn't have process. And more importantly, AI doesn't have a body, all right? And that's kind of the most important part of it. If you just churn out images without making them your own, through your own, your hands, your mind, your whole body, and so on. I don't think it's art, it's, it's something else. It's valid, okay? I don't really make value judgments about this. But again, that's the whole thing about handmade well-being. It's about the body. It's about students, young people, artists, craftsmen, whatever you want to call them, doing things doing things, and very often doing things together, which is another very important thing that AI will never be able to do, okay? There's no such thing as together for AI. So don't worry too much about the AI. Use it, why not? You know, it's just a tool, after all. For the moment, it's such a powerful tool that a lot of people are very concerned about it, but it's just a tool, okay? So I'll just conclude on this with this really weird images that uh, Key seemed to have <laughs> really enjoyed producing through AI. Uh, and to basically say that the whole idea of uh, well-being is at the root of any activities, whether you call it art or, or craft, and which is why you, we will continue and we'll talk to, spend the whole day talking about this. And I overran quite a lot, I think. I, I apologize, sorry about this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank, Professor Frank Crinon, for the presentation. Please be seated. 如果大家呢一陣間有問題想問翻阿 Frank 就住啱啱嗰個誒、呃、演講嘅話咧，大家可以抹低線嘅。咁一陣間去到嘉賓討論環節咧，我哋有個 Q&A session， 大家可以再發問嘅。